It all starts in Syria. Seven uh, I'm sorry, uh, 175 to uh, 163 BC. It was the king of Syria. He was the first to try and outlaw Judaism. He was, um, he was angry. He thought people, uh, Jews, were the reason his people were opposing his policies. So he started making all kinds of laws, such as outlawing the Sabbath and circumcision, which was in interesting when I was reading this last night because what a coincidence. In San Francisco, this November, they're actually voting on banning circumcision. Huh. We'll get back to that later. We have the Crusades that were killing the Christians and the Jews and the Muslims. We have that. It was, it was an awful bloody time. In 1215, Pope Innocent III decreed that Jews should wear a solid yellow circle sewn into an upper garment. He said, Jews are doomed to wander about the earth as fugitives and vagabonds, and their faces must be covered with shame. Remember the yellow circle. In 1240, King Louis IX ordered the Talmud be put on trial in Paris and ended up burning thousands of copies of it. He ordered the expulsion of many Jews and confiscated their lands for his use. In 1290, King Edward expelled uh, the Jews from England. 1306, 1394, Jews were kicked out of France. 1394, Jews expelled from Hungary. 1421, they're kicked out of Austria. You seeing a pattern? 1492, 200,000 Jews were expelled from Spain when Columbus were sailing the ocean blue. The reason? They were afraid Jews would taint newly converted Christians. 1445 to 1495, same thing was happening in Lithuania. Pattern, you got it? 1497, the Jews are expelled from Portugal. This time is also the time that marked the start of Jews not being permitted at all in Russia for 200 years. 1543, Martin Luther. This is the guy who fundamentally changed Christianity, but he's also the guy that penned the Jews and their lies. His recommendation was for violence, burning synagogues, destroying their homes, confiscating Jewish holy books, confiscating property, forcing physical labor, and expelling the Jews. Many argue that Hitler, who did call Luther a great reformer, was inspired by Luther. If a prominent religious leader such as Luther made it acceptable to hate Jews, imagine how widespread this was. Ask yourself this question. If you didn't know this part of history, why didn't you know this part of history? By the way, footnote, later the Lutheran Church renounced those views, but many argue that Hitler used them to legitimize his own ideas, but Hitler was crazy. 1555, Jews in Italy, forced into ghettos. Remember the yellow circle? This time they're made to wear yellow hats outside of the ghetto. In 1648, 100,000 Jews are killed in the Ukraine. Up until 1772, Jews weren't permitted in Russia, and then we get to 1925, Mein Kampf, Hitler. But it wasn't just in Germany. This disease, again, we all have blood on our hands, spreads to the United States. In 1939, the St. Louis shows up. This is a German ship carrying Jewish refugees. It was denied entry into the U.S. We wouldn't take them. We turned the ship around, knowing that they were headed towards their death. By 1945, somebody had effectively tried to exterminate the Jews. Oh, Hitler was very effective. 67% of all European Jews were murdered. Nearly 6 million out of 8.8 .8 million. Think of this, America, because that was done without any real technology. Imagine an uprising now. Imagine these kinds of ideas with full GPS and other state-of-the-art technologies. How would anyone escape that or even better? If you're all gathered in one place like Israel and somebody wants to vaporize you because Allah says it's your job to vaporize, imagine what could be done. Crazy? Watch this. Okay, 
We all know what Hitler did, even though people like Ahmadinejad deny what Hitler did. But I want to show you what else was happening around the same time, mainly in the Middle East. It's gone under the radar for some unknown reason, and it explains almost everything you see in the Middle East. It explains why they want to drive the Jews into the sea. It explains why they say the Holocaust never happened. By the end of this program, my hope is, the only thing that will remain unexplained in your mind is why the world, who promised never ever again doesn't see the old hatreds brewing once again. Or if they do see, I mean, I don't know how you can miss the protest and the chance of Jew, Jew, Jew. If they do see, why don't they care? I think I'm gonna utter the words that I don't think I've ever said before. I agree with Chuck Schumer. Wow, that seems weird. Chuck Schumer said something I, I found pretty amazing and I want you to see it. The reason there's not peace in the Middle East is very simple. It's because the majority of Palestinians and the majority of Arabs don't believe there should be an Israel. It's plain and simple. And anyone who tries to figure out, try to figure out a way to solve this conflict without realizing that truth will never get anywhere. That is true. Now, the left is all up in arms because, as we have seen, their support with the freedom flotillas and other Palestinian causes, they are not, they don't care about Israel or the Jews. They know this will put the whole world in play and put the Western world on the ropes. They're trying to convince the world that the Palestinians are the ones who are being oppressed by Israel. But when you see how steeped in hate the traditions of prominent groups such as the Muslim Brotherhood are, it becomes very clear that Chuck Schumer is right. My gosh, I've said it twice. I want to take you back to 1921. Mohammed Almin al Husani. He is appointed as the Grand Mufti. That's the teacher of Islamic law. He was, grand, he was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. He was the most prominent Arab figure in Palestine. He also happened to be one of the most bigoted human beings of all time. This is when Jerusalem and all this territory was owned by the British. He urged followers to kill the Jews wherever you find them. Throughout the late 1920s and 30s, he led violent riots opposing the establishment for a national home for the Jewish state in Palestine. His resistance caught the attention of Hassan al-Banna. Who is that? This is the guy who in 1928 founded the group called the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Seeking to expand the scope of the group, he recruited leaders from surrounding nations. He allied with the Mufti to represent the Brotherhood in Palestine. Well, as it turns out, this guy also hated the Jews. What a coincidence. So their jihad included mass demonstrations in Egyptian cities, and their slogans were, down with the Jews, get the Jews out of Egypt and Palestine. Basically, well, these are actually more tame than what you're seeing uh, being touted now on the streets of Egypt. They published a regular column. It was called The Danger of the Jews in Egypt, and they called for the boycott of Jewish goods. Believe it or not, it gets much, much worse than this. It turns out that the Grand Mufti, remember the guy with the funny hat, he, um, he made a new friend, and his new friend was in Germany. They shared a common trait. His new friend was none other than Adolf Hitler. There they are together, meeting in person. The Mufti sent him 15 drafts of declarations he wanted Germans and Italy to make concerning the Middle East. He was later sought for war crimes for his role in heavily recruiting for the SS, the Nazi Party's elite military unit that was responsible for many of the deaths in the Holocaust. It is estimated that his role, the Mufti, led to hundreds of thousands of Jews being murdered. By the way, he was, they believe, allowed to escape by, who would have guessed it, the French. Now, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, Albana, was also admirer of the Fuhrer and wrote him frequently. So close was the relationship and so common was the enemy that during the 1930s, the Brotherhood even ended up becoming an arm of the Nazi intelligence and propaganda. And the Nazis were happy to help. They provided the Brotherhood with funds, men's, weapon, propaganda training, anything they needed. 
What once was a small little group fledgling to stay alive here, they, they grew into a million strong, thanks in large part to the Nazi support. They helped mainstream Jew hatred in the entire Arab world. In fact, it grew so, so strong that Persia changed its name to Iran in 1935, due in large part to the influence of the Nazis. Iran means Aryan. The propaganda broadcast became so popular uh, during the most, uh, most of the war, um, everybody was listening to it. And if you think that was then, well, let me give you a comparison. Here's al Qaradawi. Remember him? This is the current Muslim Brotherhood leader who sounds just like Hitler. This guy has a broadcast every week that is heard and seen by 40 million Arabs every week. Now, how about the part of the story that nobody seems to be concerned about? Tying it right back today. This is uh, a story that we told you last week. I haven't seen it anyplace else. A group of Egyptians have now proclaimed the establishment of a new Nazi party. But they say, and no, it's, a, it's in a contemporary frame of reference, as if the problem with the Nazis were the outdated uniforms. More in just a second. We're talking a little bit about the Middle East, and um, I know this seems like it doesn't relate a lot to your life today, but it does, because I believe the Western way of life is at stake, and this is the final play. Uh, things will start to shake apart, and you will start to see Europe um, start to shake apart. The economies of the world, the currencies of the world will start to shake apart, and um, uh, we will be more and more active in places like Libya, and then... The world will gather to chase the Jews into the sea, and that will spend the, uh, uh, spell the end of the West unless we stand together. You hear a lot about the players in the Middle East, like Hamas and Hezbollah, but the truth is most people don't have a clue. We don't know anything about them. I was the same until recently. I want to show you who they are and what I have found about them. A lot of it is pretty easy. Hezbollah was created back in 1982. It was a group of Islamic Revolutionary Guards from Iran. The goal was to spread the Islamic Revolution across the Arab world. Where did that revolution come from? Well, the revolution that was inspired by the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. These are the people that are pushing for the new Arab Spring now. Their time has come. At least that's what they believe. Iran's own revolution was started by this guy, and he believed, and so does Hezbollah, that they can make it happen elsewhere. This time, it's for the entire world. Hezbollah is obviously directly tied to Iran and often acts in its behest. Before 9-11, Hezbollah was known um, as the organization that was responsible for more American deaths than any other terrorist organization. Why? They first appeared on everybody's radar in 1983, the Marine Barracks bombing, which took the lives of 241 of our troops. Now, I told you earlier about the roots, uh, the roots of the Mufti. Remember, that was the original Mufti. He was a key figure for Muslims in Palestine, especially since he was anti-British and anti-Jewish. Have it? Then we have Hamas. <laughs> 